Hey everybody, it's Ted Davenport. Welcome to another episode of the Producers Perspective Live. You see my arm, eyes dart all around because I'm actually, I've got like 142 screens open here trying to keep this all straight. And every time I click this screen yard thing, it just blows up and sees and I'm staring at a version of my face, which is like giant excitement. Here. So sorry about that if you see my eyes darting back and forth. Uh, welcome to everybody. We have been on the air for a week now. It has been one week. Can you believe it? It seems like a year and a half. We've been all stuck inside our homes, doesn't it? Uh, but it's only been a week. It's only been a week. Uh, and we've got some more weeks to come from the news that's hit the airwaves today. But we're in this together. We're all in this together. That's why it started. Uh oh. I'm hearing. That we have some sound issues underwater again. Let's see if. Okay, hold on, everybody. Just stay tuned. We're going to try to fix this just like we did last time, the same way we did last time. How's that? Is that better? Is that better? Bear with us. Bear with us. Hello, hello. Hmm, interesting. It should clear up in just one moment. Give us a second. I'm going to stop the camera for one second. I'm going to disappear. Is that better? Sound better? Not better yet. Not better yet. Give us a second here. We're going to, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back. Just give me one moment, one moment. How's that? Is that better? I have gone away and come back. Do you hear me now? Someone give me an update on that sound and I'm crossing my fingers that it's better. Don't know what's happening right now. Thumbs up. Give me a live comment on the sound. Yes, we've done it. We have succeeded. We pulled it off. Golly, this live stuff. Someone remind me not to get involved in anything that involves live performance. Oh, wait, I work in the theater. Damn it. Okay, I'm back. Sound is great. Sorry, some kind of a little internet glitch, but we are back uh, and I'm very excited to be here. I was talking about my eyes darting back and forth and you missed it because it wasn't that interesting. Anyway, here we are, we're back. This has now the second week of all of us being stuck inside and live streaming together. Uh, thanks so much for being a part of this. We're getting emails from all over. We're getting social media messages from all over. It sounds like you are enjoying this series, so we're gonna keep it going as long as we are all stuck inside, just as a reminder that we may be alone, we may not be able to gather together, we may not be, be able to go to a rehearsal together or a show together, but that doesn't mean we're not together. Uh, we're all still together. and. Uh, our hearts go out to everyone that's suffering and all the families that are suffering right now. That's, I think, some of the hardest part of this is uh, the folks who are in the hospital not being able to be with their loved ones right now. So our hearts go out to them, but we are going to power through. We're going to get through this thing and we're going to get through it together uh, with people like my upcoming guest tonight. Uh, we have a fantastic guest. The great thing about the theater, and I think the reason why I'm in the theater is because when you do shows, you end up just like walking away with a whole new suitcase of friends. It's just the best. So I was an only child. I didn't have any brothers and sisters until I got some, a whole bunch of half brothers and step brothers and sisters. Uh, when I was about 10, it was like instant family, uh, which was awesome. And, but when I was younger, I didn't have uh, any siblings and only a couple of friends. So whenever I would, my, my parents got me involved with the theater, God bless them. And whenever I would do a show, it was like, Hey, there's like 10 more people. It's like 10 more friends. Then do another one, it's like 20 more friends, right? We all know what that's like. If you've been involved with the theater, you just walk away and you get these show friends. Well, 
That's what happens to me. It's one of the reasons why I think I do as many things as I do. Now that I think about it, this is becoming like an instant therapy session. One of the reasons I'm so active and I produce lots of stuff and people say like, what are you doing this and that? Because frankly, I love having friends and I love having theater friends. And the guy I have on tonight, Steven Sater, the book writer for Spring Awakening, has become a great friend uh, as well as a professional that I love working with. So I'm thrilled to have him on Spring Awakening, Alice by Heart. We're going to talk about all that stuff. We're going to talk about the stuff he's working on now. Um, but before we do, reminders of why we're here. Why we're here. We're here to spread the message. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, stay home. Don't forget, just don't go outside. What's the point? And I'm going to write a little blog about how they should be marketing this message actually a little bit better to people. Um, and it has to do with a, uh, an Instagram post I read very recently. And I read it and I was like, you know what? I am, I'm already staying home, but I don't want to get that thing. So I am locking myself in and locking my family in. So look out for that blog post coming up. Don't forget, we're here also to draw attention to the Actors Fund, actorsfund.org. Uh, we have a little tip jar on my Facebook page right now. I think we've raised five, 600 bucks already for the Actors Fund. That's going to go a long way for someone. So please fill that or uh, don't hesitate to check that out. Uh, and lastly, we're here again for, for all of us. Okay, we're here for all of us. Uh, to have some fun and talk about theater and to remind ourselves that we are going to get on the other side of this, right? So speaking of the other side of this, I have no idea what that means. Let's get to today's guest. He is the book writer for Spring Awakening. He's the lyricist for Spring Awakening, Alice by Heart. He's a friend, one of the most well-read and smartest guys I know. I mean, he's a poet. I mean, you just say that and it's like, he's a smart guy. Mr. Stephen Sater. Welcome, Stephen. Hi. Hi, Ken. How are you? I'm always amazed when this thing actually works, to be honest. Know, Someone like, appears out of nowhere. How are you? I'm okay. I'm doing okay. I'm staying home. You know, Good. Like, like, like everyone else. When you said that, you know, just now, and we've all heard it so many times, stay home, stay healthy, whatever you said, stay, whatever it was, I, I welled up with tears when you said it. No. I don't know why, I'm just, you know, but, um, but I'm doing all right. I'm here. How long have you been home now? Like, were you, or answer this question for me, I've been asking everybody, where were you and what were you doing when you, when, as I say, the virus hit the fan, when you realized, oh shit, this is different and I have to go home. I have to lock myself. Where were you when it all happened? Honestly, I was in a hotel in LA. Really? I was, yeah. And I was in a, and I had to stay in LA a couple days later. And I went to my um, producer's house. She's a producer for two projects I'm doing, one for TV and one a movie, both musical projects. And um, I was at her home and we were meeting all day. And I was, had moved, had to move my plane till the next day. And she was like all about this. And she was pulling out surgical gloves to give me. And I was like, really? And then it was like, she said, this is a pandemic, Stephen. You need to get home. Mm -hmm. And I left. And mm -hmm. I came home and um, yeah, I mean, it's very intense in my building right now. They will not let workmen in to like, you know, help. like I broke the ceiling. I have asthma, which is not a great time to have. Oh my God. And I have a duplex and I'm at the top of a building. So the air pressure gets kind of intense and my ceiling fan won't work. And I don't know how to make my ceiling fan work. And so I called like down, you know, can someone come help? And I can't even reach it. Can someone help me? And it's like, no, we're not allowed to come to your apartment. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that as woe as me. I'm just saying that's how intensely it's being handled. No, we. Th I think my daughter threw like one of her toys in the toilet in here. We can't get this thing to flush. It's the same thing. I'm like, I don't know why I'm gonna have to dig in there myself. It's, yeah, um, yeah they won't, It's which is great. Like every time someone says something to me, like, no, we can't do that. No, we. I'm like, you know what? That's good because that's oh, actually right. the only way we're going to get through this yeah. is if people say, no, I'm not doing that for you. I'm not picking that up for you. I'm not bringing that to you. No. Uh, I'll tell you something. This is not a nice story. I was, I had to go to, um, I have had to go out for an oral surgeon. I had an ill time kind of oral surgery that didn't go that well. And I've been, this is, I've been on antibiotics, but anyway, I was going up to see him on Friday. And this young woman who I guess was kind of after hours, she, I guess she was cleaning. And I was standing in the elevator and she started just pushing into the elevator. And I said, way up. 
I said, you know, let's go, let me get out or you come back. And she said, I'm not doing, she started just screaming at me so violently, so intently. And I was just trying to say, let's not be the two of us in this elevator, you know, with your cart of supplies. Um, it's like, yeah, people are, a lot of people are on edge. Yeah, it's also, you know what? I, I, everyone has permission to be rude right now. Everyone yeah. has permission to be like, you know what? I don't want you in my elevator right now. Fuck you. I'm not shaking your hand. No, no. I really want nothing to do with you. So stay away. It's like it's like an introvert's dream right now. Right? That's um, so uh, what what are you doing to fill your days? Are you working on projects you're working on right now? How are you? Really? Yeah. Awesome. You know something fun, funny about me is it's like, it's not funny, but it's like I've been in training for this for so many years. I spend, well, to be honest, it really goes back. I was hospitalized so much as a kid. You know, I was, we talked about this. I was like in a room that was like covered with plastic and then I was, had a bad accident. So I'm very accustomed to, and I've trained myself and I work so hard, as you know, I'm so kind of relentless. I'm very accustomed to just staying in for days with my books and pencils and I could show you, I could turn this camera and you would see heaps of books and papers around me. So I'm staying in and I'm working, I work on the floor. So I'm working on the floor, we're surrounded by books and papers. And um, I do have a lot of projects um, right now. You know, I have a lot of fortune right now. This just happened that it so happens that two of my musicals are being turned into film projects. Oh my gosh. And so, I, and then not even that that's fortunate that that's happening, but it's fortunate, like it's a great, because the theater's not happening. You know, I'm here like working on these movie versions of my shows. And then I'm working on an original musical for TV, which is, that's more like meetings. That's like Zoom meetings, the world mm -hmm. of Zoom. And then I'm working on my, so this is, this will be the end of this long list. I'm working on, um, a novel which I've been working on for years, which is why I wrote the Alice by Heart novel. Well, I said yes because I wanted to get back to novel writing, so this is a good time for that too. Mm -hmm. to shut down. So, so the fortune is I have non-theater things even while theater things are happening. So right. And yeah. you are one of the you, you when you start talking about the books and papers all around you, you write in longhand, right? I do. You are I do. Still, no computer, none of it, just all written out. Not, yes, do I have a laptop here? Yes, do I go on it? Yes. But I write longhand in moleskin pads, and then I rewrite, and then um, a lot of it my assistant inputs, um, and then I scrawl rewrites all over. Here, I'll just... Yeah, let's, let's, looking at this right now. Like, this is amazing, everyone. We're about to see, like... <laughs> like that. See your drafts. See? Like I'm, I rewrite, I scrawl all over it. I don't know how to hold this to get it to show, but I have pages and pages like that stacked around me. Um, well, you know, have, you have you ever lost anything? Like, I've been pretty good. I mean, I've been pretty fortunate that I've held on to everything. Have I lost things? Um, I've had intense periods of like, oh my God, we don't see that thing. And I would have to go like the stacks and stacks of like things that are rewritten and, and usually I've found them. So the, the very very effective. There, because I know we have a lot of Spring Awakening fans. Uh, and yeah. let, me, let me just take a side note and say that producing Spring Awakening was without a doubt one of the highlights of my career, not only because I got to meet you, but just because of the production and Michael's work, Michael Arden's work on it. And it changed my life professionally, personally, all of it. But are you telling me that the original you have do you have the longhand version of Spring Awakening somewhere? I have um I have a lot of lyrics handwritten and hand typed. For a while, I didn't grow up using a manual typewriter, you know, but I ha I, I had this affectation for about 15 years where like it was a period beginning kind of mid 90s where I started using manual typewriters. By the way, Tom Hanks has an amazing collection of manual typewriters that I've been in that room a lot where he has them. And I had a couple of them like that. Anyway, I um, have lyrics like I have Touch Me and The Dark I Know Well hand typed with the where I fax them to Duncan and I have the fax return sheet of Duncan um, receiving them. I have totally fucked, and I'll tell you this, 
um, it has the exact number of blah, blah, blahs in what <laughs> I sent him than it does on the recording. He wow. said exactly. Well, was that damn good? That was that fucking good, actually, if you'll uh, allow me to say that. So you, it sounds like you and Duncan, who's obviously a frequent collaborator of yours, are you're talking about faxing each other stuff. <laughs> it sounds like you're used to working remotely. That's how you work. That's how you work. So this is not new for you. It's it's completely how we work. Now we do, now we do it by email. Like I email him a lyric, and he emails back an MP3. And that doesn't mean we might not get on the phone to talk about it because we might. And it's ninety eight percent of the time I send him something, he just sends back verbatim what I sent him. Sometimes he calls and says, "Can you give me another one of these?" And I say, can you play me what you're doing? He'll say, no, just give me another one like that. You know, like he wants another line or another verse or another, or sometimes he'll record it and just sing the same verse twice. And I say, Duncan, why don't you just tell me you needed another lyric for that? For that? But he just does it. Can I tell you a random story? It's so random yeah. for Spring Awakening fans, it's cool. Because I just remembered it when I was saying this earlier thing. When I wrote Left Behind, I wrote all the things he ever did or left behind. And when my assistant input it, she put all things he ever lived or left behind. It was just a typo. And I sent it to Duncan. He said, all things he ever lived. And Michael Mayer said, oh, we've got to do all the things. And Roger Bart, who was playing the masked man, who originally sang it at that time, said, oh, no, it's two notes, all things. You can't add in a the. Mm -hmm. so that was Is that funny? Yeah. Genius. I'm just, uh, I'm going to make a note to Mary as I type this, as we talked, or as I say this, because as you talked about your story about growing up in the accident, I want everyone to hear that. Mary, throw the link to Stephen's podcast into the live comments so everyone can hear the story of that, because it's an incredible and touching uh, story, and also how you overcame those odds are just uh, tremendous. Um, so you're used to working remotely. For those people who are writing, uh, right now, the writers in the room or any creators in the room that have to work remotely right now. What's your top tip for a successful online communication or collaboration? Like what? Obviously, it works for you guys. You got some hardware on the mantle. So, uh, oh, mine? Or you're asking? You're asking people listening. No, I'm asking you. What are your? I tips think, for I know what I think is. Um, which might be the opposite of what someone wants to hear. But I think it's it's being really intensely a private and trusting your private heart in what you create and then meeting your collaborator there as opposed to being in the room and the best idea wins. I'm not a big fan of writing by committee and the best compromise and the best. I'm like, here's my thing. And then Duncan does his thing. James Bourne is another composer I work with a lot. I've written Murder at the Gates, and we have a new show. This is a musical I'm working on now, a new musical, and it's super cool, and the music is electronic. And we were, he's, he is quarantined in Cornwall in England right now. And we were, Scott, and when he and I work, he's often in England, and he calls me and we Skype and we go through the song. And I, we, I definitely improve the lyric when I listen to it. I, uh, nudge him to change things in the music. So there's a definite back and forth, but we each have a private process like Duncan and I do. Hmm. So that's what I would say. I say trust us in your private heart. And you you do such a such a wide diversity of the types of projects you do. Where do you get your ideas for shows? And what, what makes you go that? I'm doing a musical of, of that. I've got to do that. It's something I feel in my gut, and I trust my gut. Can and anything? You know the story of how Spring Waking started, right? I do, but some of these folks may not. So let's hear. It's a good one. So let's hear it again. Well, Duncan and I—I I won't go through the whole story. Duncan and I met as Buddhists chanting together, and we started writing songs together. I'll just make that fast. <laughs> okay. We had this amazing meeting. We wrote these two songs for a play of mine, which was called Umbridge. And he came to see the play like a couple months after this. And in the meantime, I started sending him lots of lyrics because I caught this new bug. I had never written lyrics. I never thought about it. And he had said to me, we should do an album together. So he saw the show. He loved the show. I know I'm talking fast. That's me. And I said, we should do a piece of theater together. And he made this face and said, musical theater. And I said, well, if we could do something cool. And he said, 
he says these were not his words. This is my version of his words, but he said this point. He said, um, if I were gonna do a piece of musical theater, I would wanna write something where the music was relevant to the culture at large. And the moment he said it, I just thought of Spring Awakening. I swear mm -hmm. to God, it was just an instinct from deep down. It was just a play that I knew. Huh. My answer, you see all these books, that's like, that's where I, like I'm, I've been nurtured for so many years by literature and I think of things and they just seem, I have to be able to hear the composer in the, in the idea. That's part of it for me. Mm. You know, in my show, Some Lovers, that idea, I just could hear Bert in this story, The Gift of the Magi, the O. Henry story. I could just hear his music in the story. And, um, and then later I make sense of that idea. And I think when we listen to Bert, we remember years ago listening to Bert, and this is a story about past and present, and I kind of make sense of it, and that becomes part of the structure of the show. But the first thing is just instinct. You are one of the most prolific writers I know. You're working on many shows at once. Uh, you're very fat. How do you, how, you obviously would recommend that to other writers, like have a few things going at once, I assume. Sure. And how do you keep them straight? And do you, oh, I'm gonna work 20 minutes on this one and 20 minutes on this one or an hour on this one, or do you all day, like, um, do you, it all? you know, it kind of depends on what's going on, what I need to get done. You know, you're doing a workshop of something and suddenly, um, like our piece, which I don't know if we're gonna talk about that we're, we've worked on, to, that we're working on together. Like, I know a workshop's coming up. I've been doing this movie and this thing and this thing. I know this workshop is coming up. So, so whatever it is, you know, however long it needs, four weeks before three, I like kind of get into that gear. And then I throw myself in. And you know, I am someone who really gets into bed with directors. I mean, Spring Lake Queen would never be what it is without Michael Mayer at every turn. He was so, yeah. I'm, that, I'm that way with every, like I, I really, for good and bad, sometimes they lead you astray. But um, so, for example, on this piece you and I are working on, which I'll just say we happen to be working with Lee Silverman, and I would like get Lee on the phone. It would be like important to me to like get her on, even if that's all I got was one phone call or two over four weeks. I would get her on the phone. I take rabid notes in my in my moleskin, and then I go to work. And then I just I don't. I'm not someone who writes like between 12 and three. I just write as much as I can when I can. And I have earplugs. I go into that place. I work intently hard. I work as hard on it as I can. I do everything I can. And then I raise my hand and try and get my director's attention again. And it's like, can we can we go through this? It's so funny. I love it. And we're working on something. And I am, uh, for those of you who see me looking off to the side right now, it's because I have a second monitor right here. And what I'm doing is I am looking for something, a link that I can send you to a beautiful movie that I was turned on to by Mr. Sater. Uh, and it's a project that he and I are doing together. It's called Mavi and Rose. It's a beautiful film. Um, and it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful movie, a uh, musical, sorry. And I am going, and uh, Mary's going to put it into the chat room right now. Uh, Mary, I just sent it to you. Um, so you should watch it. I mean, we got time. Watch, watch movies. Watch this one. Watch it. It's beautiful, beautiful. Uh, and oh, look, we have some folks. Troy has seen it. Um, so I love that you just write. You just puke it all up. Do you edit as you go? I do. You I do. See no, I do. Well, you know, um, like in my novel, for example. Um, I'm just saying this because it was a couple hours ago. I wrote this new section. I hand wrote it. I read it to my assistant by the phone. She's in Philadelphia. I read her the thing. As I read it aloud before she said anything, just reading it aloud, I started editing it. I started changing it. I started rewriting it. Then I read it to her. Then we talked about it. Then I worked on it. So do I just write it first? I do. But then do I start editing? I do. I edit things. I'm not, yeah. And what's, I think what's what's really important is to know what what the heart and soul of the thing is and not to compromise that. And then if you know that, then you can be open to crit criticism from yourself and from other people. You have to be a very smart producer. You never say too much and the things you say are all, and I don't necessarily agree with all of them, but everything is incisive. Everything is like, what about if you did this? 
And it's like, wow, I hadn't thought of that. The funny thing is, is I love when people disagree with me because one, I, I, I sometimes, you know, it's, it's the challenge. It's the back and forth. That's the collaboration. Or I love when I, I make a suggestion or a thought to a writer like you and you're like, no, that's because this, this, and this, and this. And th I learn from that. I, oh, right. I get it. I get it. I get it. And that debate and having someone like you fight for something you believe in, it, frankly, it's just like, oh, that's super important for them. And there's a reason. And it's Stephen fucking Sater. So do, do whatever you want. Um, let's take a question about that. Uh, this is a fun question about the process from Drew Rieger. Do you act out your characters aloud as you're writing dialogue from them? I don't. I don't. You know, you know, I don't. I don't. How, no, I don't. However, well, I can say two, a couple of things to that. However, I did act all through sort of high school and college. And so I have an instinctive sense of it as dialogue. And I once I have a scene, I do read it aloud to my sister. And I read it. I don't act out. I don't do that. That said, I will say that over the eight years of developing um, Spring Awakening, we were all we very often read scripts aloud at Michael. We would like read scenes aloud. And I was always Moritz. Until John Gallagher, I was always Moritz. And he knows this. <laughs> and and um, yeah, what can I say? But but no, I don't I don't get up and act it out or, or act it out in that way. I just I can kind of hear it in my head, but I do really believe in reading things aloud. I really do. That you learn a lot from reading things aloud. You mentioned your your very capable assistant several times. And yeah. I believe, I believe your assistant is backstage with us this evening. She might be. Let's let's bring her on just for a quick hello. Maybe she's like eating ice cream right now, but Mary, can you bring her on? Are you here, Elizabeth? I'm Hi. here. Hello. <laughs> there we go. Hello. Hi to everybody. Hi, it's me, Elizabeth. It's your big creative here. What? She plays Melchior. Oh, <laughs> she yeah. Melchior. Yeah. All right. I just wanted to give you some, I wanted to give you a little shout out there. So thank you. It's nice to say hi. <laughs> waiting. Well, thanks, thanks for bringing him on. Uh, so Stephen, uh, I know I have have to ask this question because I know many people are wondering. You mentioned two movies at the top. Uh, <laughs> is one of them, is one of them ask me. Um, mm. Or just want to give everyone some kind of teaser update, yeah. maybe hint, yeah. gossip, rumor. Yeah. Well, I will say that one of these movies is indeed based on a beloved and well-known musical for which I wrote the book and lyrics. And I will say that, I won't say its name, but I will say that nothing is definitive, but I will say that um, things are in process. How's that? That is amazing. And frankly, that is the type of good news, <laughs> whether or not whoever knows, like I, we know, God knows, especially with Hollywood, uh, but even just that glimmer of hope for that beloved musical that you wrote the book and lyrics to that I produced. Uh, that's the kind of thing that helps get us through. So thanks, uh, thanks for sharing yeah. that with us. Uh, and it's thanks, for, thanks for being here tonight. I want to shout out to a couple things before we say goodbye. First of all, I want to say I saw Alice by Heart at MTC uh, this past year, which I loved. Cast recording is out right now, which everyone can get. Look at that. There's a nice, incredible visual. Uh, <laughs> and also, the book is out. Yeah. Tell not. us about this. This is something new and different that most musicals don't do this kind of thing. Tell us why and how, and that's where you can get it. This was a really big deal for me because, as you can see, I'm such a book person. And it was Kurt Deutsch who pushed me to do it. And I thought he was insane. And I, because it's, you know, we, we spent, it's such a weird, spectacular, curiouser and curiouser book, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland to begin with. And we'd spent eight years trying to make it into music. It's like, are you going to turn it back into a book? But he won, he convinced me. And um, I worked on it for two or three years and I brought me tremendous joy. And I have to say a lot of the story that people kind of wanted in the musical I was able to explore in the book, which is to say the backstory of Alice and Alfred, the war, 1940, how they met, how they fell in love, 
how she escaped her house on fire, how she found him in the rubble. There's all this backstory. And I, um, you know, I love writing fiction. It allows you to access characters in a different way than you do in a musical. Mm-hmm. So um, anyway, it's a real labor of love. And yes, it's available remotely, you know, on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Indiebound and all those places. One more question before you go, because you talk about writing it over two to three years. I mean, that's a long time. And Spring Awakening took however many years, uh, to get it, eight years to get it to the stage. How do you keep yourself energized and motivated throughout those many years of hard, hard work? Or how do you keep yourself motivated over, I don't know, four or five weeks of work on something that may feel like eight years, like the next few weeks of a lot of our lives? How do you keep yourself up and going? You know, what I would say is that I have so much desire. Like I want so badly to do things well. Like I want things to be able to, you know, when I was writing Spring Awakening, I had this, it was after the shootings at Columbine, and I had this determination to touch the troubled heart of youth around the world. And I think back, Ken, when you and I were at the White House, you know, and how much that meant to people and how many messages I received. Now it's about Alice by Heart. I received so many messages from people about the show, about the album, about the book. And so that's what keeps me going. Not the desire to hear back from people, but to touch people, to make a difference. What I love about that is, and you had a mission. You had a mission to touch the troubled heart of youth, right? And that mission, you didn't think, I want to write a Tony Award winning musical. I want to have royalties coming in from the German production or the Australian production or the high schools. You just said, I want, I want to do something for other people. And that is what brings success to people. It's not about focusing on, I'm, I want a Lamborghini. I don't know who wants a Lamborghini now anyway. But, uh, it's about doing something for other people. And when you focus solely on that, look what happens. All this good comes back to you. You so deserve it. Oh. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, enjoy and best of luck throughout this and on all your projects. Uh, and I appreciate your friendship and inspiration so much. I do too, Ken, yours. You're one of a kind. Oh, thank you. We'll see you, and I'll talk to you tomorrow because we got some stuff to talk about. Get some, we got to get some stuff going. We got to get some stuff going. All right. Say goodbye to Steven Sater, everybody. Bye. And that, I love, I have to say again, that, that really is what it's all about right there, is he's not focused on all the things that so many people are focused on these days. Uh, He's not focused on the material things. He's focused on his writing, doing good for other people. He's focusing on touching people, moving people, uh, and helping people. Spring Awakening did just that. There's a lot of teenagers that are better off. There are a lot of people that are better off just because he put that musical out into the world. And I'm better off for having produced it. Uh, So that's what you want success? Focus on that. Focus on that. Or there's a very simple way to do that is when you meet someone, when you talk to someone, tomorrow, just say, how can I help you? How can I help you? Throwing that out there, it'll bounce back and it'll come to you. And there's never a better time to help other people than right now with everything that so many people are going through. Uh, how you can help other people? Actorsfund.org. That's a great way. Or check out our, my Facebook page and just click on the donate button. Uh, tomorrow, we have another fantastic guest. Ah, Jen Tepper. Jen Tepper is here, social media guru, Broadway historian. Someone you never want to go up against in a game of Broadway trivia ever. She will kick your ass all over the place. She knows everything. She's a published author. She produced Be More Chill, you know, that amazing, amazing story from last year. Uh, She, little known secret, she used to work for me. Uh, Now someday I have a feeling I'll be begging her for a job. She's on the uh, live stream tomorrow. We're going to have a blast. She's one of the first people I talked to when I talked about doing this thing, by the way, about a week ago. And lots of other people coming up this week. I think Alan Cumming is after that. Look at that. Alan Cumming's going to be here. Lee Silverman, who was referenced tonight, Sergio, Janine. More people are getting on board the live stream train after that. Mary just obviously is slacking off and hasn't done the graphic. Oh, she has. Look at that. She just is like nana, nana, nana right now. I am working even though I'm working from home, Ken. She really just made me look like an a-hole right there. Kevin McCollum, Susan Blackwell, a whole bunch of other people coming up. 
Don't forget facebook.com backslash Ken Davenport. Do me a favor, okay? If you're enjoying these live streams, tell other people about them. Tell other people about them. We just want more people engaged in conversation about the theater, right? Because we want theater to come back even bigger and better than it was before. And how we do that is we keep the ball up in the air by talking about it, by hearing from these great people. And I'm sure you were inspired by Steven Sater tonight. Yeah, he'll inspire Kevin McCollum, Jen Tepper, Alan Cumming. They're going to inspire all your friends as well. Uh, and we'll get through this together. Thanks so much for being here for episode seven, eight. Who cares? It's all one big game. We'll see you tomorrow on the next live stream with Jen Tepper. Thanks so much for being here, everybody.